Murphy, or O'Murrachu in the Irish, is an old name, a very old name. But nothing in Ireland, except maybe the land itself, is as old as Newgrange. This ancient tomb was over 3,000 years old at the birth of Christ. So for over 5,000 years, it saw the arrivals of the varied peoples that came to our shores, and sadly too, it witnessed the departure of millions of Irish men and women who left us and today are scattered all over the world. So let us go then, you and I, on an Irish journey, an hour's journey only, but endless in the imagination. A journey right through this beautiful country of ours, along the coasts and into the very lands and territories of your own Irish ancestors. These are the majestic cliffs of Moher. They stand defiant, holding back the relentless waves. Below the broad Atlantic, stretches all the way 3,000 miles beyond the New World. When you stand on these cliffs, you stand on the edge of Ireland, you stand on the edge of Europe. Inland from here lies the fair land of Erin, Ireland, the home of your ancestors. This is the story of your great Murphy heritage. We will trace your name from its earliest Celtic origins following its journey across the green and varied landscape of Ireland, charting the changing fortunes of your royal and noble family. Through ancient castles and aging ruins, we will rediscover the stories of the Murphys, stories of their days as warriors and rebels, as kings and earls, of great battles lost and won. We will discover too how your name has changed over the centuries and how your ancestors carried it and its traditions with them across the seas to the new worlds. As we hear these stories, we will discover the spirit, the essence of the Murphy heritage, a spirit of independence, courage and generosity which has seen the name survive for nearly a thousand years. Irish surnames, which began a thousand years ago, developed in a number of ways. If a family took their father's name, they became known as Mac, like McCarthy, because Mac means the son of. But if they were called after a more remote ancestor, they used the O, which means descended from, as in, say, O'Brien. Meanwhile, the Normans often used Fitz instead of O or Mac, as in Fitzgerald, son of Gerald. Or you could be called after the job you did, as in Smith or the place you came from, as in Welsh, from Wales. For the 60 million people throughout the world, who share an Irish ancestry. St. Patrick's Day is a time for them to come together to celebrate and rejoice in their Irish identity. Although your own family may have left these shores and settled in new lands, it is still possible to trace your ancestors back to their original homelands. Tom Lindert, one of Ireland's leading authorities on genealogy, has some useful advice. Well, it's very important that if someone's interested in doing your genealogy, that you get all your background information in your home country first. Uh, don't just try to jump straight over to Ireland. Um, the, the first thing is that you get a person that you know the most about from Ireland, be it an ancestor. Um, their name, a date to put them in history, be it a birth date, marriage date, or death date. And then a locality, as, as narrow, narrow that down as much as possible, be it a county or a townland. But make sure you have the information together to begin with, and then um, make the next step over to do research in Ireland. Once you have located an ancestor and have some idea of where they originally came from in Ireland, the records which will allow you to trace your family history are, by and large, available to you. The first place to go to is the National Archives at the Four Courts in Dublin. 
documents kept here, such as Griffith's land valuations of the 19th century and the tithe appropriate books, are invaluable in the search for your ancestors. If we take the case of a namesake of yours, we can illustrate exactly how these documents can help you. Let's look, for example, at the case of Edward Murphy. We know that Edward left Ireland in the 1890s for America. We also know that the name Murphy at that time was found throughout Ireland, but was most common in the counties of Wexford and Cork. At the four courts, we searched Griffith's valuations and found Edward's family in the Inniscarra parish of County Cork. Once we had located Edward in Inniscarra parish, we found in the Inniscarra Roman Catholic Church that Edward was baptized on the 20th of June, 1873, the son of Edward Murphy and Margaret McCarthy of Ardrum, County Cork. With this knowledge, it is possible to trace the history of Edward's family. So you see, all you need are the basic details about an ancestor, and the quest for information on your family roots can begin. The search for your ancestors is becoming easier all the time, thanks to a recent initiative called the Irish Genealogical Project. This is the Clare Heritage Centre in Corofin. The centre is at the very heart of a new and exciting development. The official surviving records relating to family history and genealogy are being collected throughout the county. They've been brought here and then put on computer. But Corofin's not alone in this. Many other heritage centres have opened up all over Ireland so that no matter where your family comes from, you should now be able to get an accurate record of your family history. It is possible to trace your ancestors even further back beyond your immediate family, but let's start at the beginning and take a look at the history, the culture and the country which shaped your forefathers. On the Aran Islands off the west coast of Ireland stands the prehistoric fort of Dún Angus, enigmatic, poised over the ocean, its ancient builders a mystery even to this day. Over 7,000 years had passed since the first settlers arrived in Ireland. Hunting in the young forests, they slowly ventured up the river valleys, building their dwellings from rough wood and animal hide, and forming small communities hidden in the forest. Two and a half thousand years before Christ, they had developed a society that was stable enough and wealthy enough to produce these majestic dolmens. This dolmen here is the Paulna Brown dolmen, situated in North Clare in the Burren country. Just another part of the wonderment that is ancient Ireland. They built mysterious circles of standing stones. These people we call the Firbolg or the Fomorians, and the Tuatha the Danon legendary children of Dana, goddess of magic. Perhaps these early peoples were among your forebears, people who would have known the names of those who lie under the great dolmens. But older than Paul Nabron, older even than the pyramids, is the passage grave at Newgrange and County Meath. Built over 5,000 years ago and designed so that on the winter solstice each year, at the moment of sunrise, a shaft of sunlight penetrates to the very heart of the mound, illuminating the intricate spirals carved in stone. New Grange was where they paid tribute to their now forgotten gods. These people were superb craftsmen in stone, but a new material was sweeping across Europe from Asia Minor. The Iron Age came to Ireland and the people who introduced the new material around 500 BC were the Celts, who for almost 2,000 years ruled Ireland as kings. The Celts were a major influence on the course of Irish history and instrumental in shaping our unique Irish identity. Let's listen to what leading archaeologist Barry Raftery of University College Dublin has to say about the Celts. Well, in the narrowest sense, the term Celtic refers to uh, a, a language 
but it is entirely appropriate to use the term in a broad cultural context. Now, the earliest reference to the term Celt was made by the Greeks about the 6th century BC. They just referred to a specific cultural grouping in Europe as Keltoi. We do not, of course, know whether the Celts themselves used that phrase uh, to describe themselves. Now, in archaeological terms, the Celtic culture begins about 700 BC in Europe, continues until it was destroyed by the Romans around about the birth of Christ. And archaeologists have divided this culture into two broad phases, named after two major fine spots in Europe, an earlier phase, which is called the Hallstatt culture, and a later phase, which is called the Latin culture. This is the Latin Celts who are best exemplified in the archaeological record. There are very serious problems of archaeological interpretation. But what we can say is that the earliest indications of contact with the Celtic culture abroad appears in Ireland around about 600 BC, when there are some indications of a Hallstatt presence in the country. We have some Hallstatt material, but it's not very substantial. Around about 300 BC, there's a greater body of archaeological material in the country, which we can certainly equate with the Celtic groups. In many ways, it displays native Irish idiosyncrasies, which set it apart from the uh, material in the Latin areas outside the country. We have a vast body of Celtic literature surviving in the country. We have the epic cycle, the Ulster cycle. We have the Fíniachta. We have a whole range of mythology. We have a superb collection of early Irish nature poetry and other poetry. But probably the principal legacy of the Celts, the most enduring, is our Celtic personality. We certainly have a distinctive personality, a warmth, a friendliness. Uh, the classical commentators describe the belligerent character of the Celts. Perhaps we have inherited that too, to a certain extent. But we certainly have a distinctive Celtic personality which sets us apart from all other European cultures. island on the edge of Europe. The island of your ancestors was divided up between a number of major Celtic clans. In the south, in what is now Munster, were the Oinacht and the Dalcash. In Connacht, to the west, were the Ibrin. In the province of Leinster, were the Ehinslig, and to the north, in Ulster, were the Enail. These clans were, in time, joined by the great Viking and Norman families. It was from the powerful E. Hinsela clan of the East that your Murphy ancestors are descended. This lovely old castle stands in the ancient royal town of Ferns in the county of Wexford. It was once the very heart and center of Murphy power in Leinster. This now peaceful place has been burned, pillaged, conquered, sacked, taken, retaken, time without number. But despite its turbulent past, the name of Murphy still lives on, not only here in Ferns, but right across Ireland through every town, every village, every province. The full extent of the Murphy Kingdom is impossible to define. Although Wexford is the heartland of the eastern domain, there are Murphy lands throughout Ireland. The story of your name begins in the 11th century. From the ranks of the Echinsula, there came a warrior chieftain named Murchok. Murchok became Lord of Leinster and ruled over a large territory which extended over much of what is now County Wexford. Murchok was a fearless seafaring warrior who was reported to have invaded the Isle of Man in 1070. When he died, his son Donna took the name Donna Mac Murchu, meaning Donna the son of Murchok. Donna's nephew, also called Murkok, took the name O Murahu, meaning Murkok descended from Murkok. Such were the origins of what is today the great Irish surname of Murphy. The old Gaelic name of Murkok is derived from the old Gaelic word for sea warrior, so that your Murphy name means 
descended from the sea warrior. Two smaller branches of Murphys came into being in the 11th century in what are now the counties of Sligo and Tyrone. You will still find Murphys in those areas today. The Murphy name has of course spread to all corners of Ireland down to the centuries and you will find Murphys in most counties in Ireland. But like most Irish families with strong roots associated with one place, the Murphys are still to be found in greatest numbers in the homelands of their ancestors. The sunny, sandy, coastal county of Wexford has been home to Murphys for nearly a thousand years. Hurling, Ireland's national sport, is reminiscent of the time when the great clans of Ireland battled for land power and the high kingship. It was the strength of Christianity that forged the first real bonds of unity in Ireland. For the Irish took very well to Christianity. So well indeed, that in a very short time her monks had established some of the most important ecclesiastical centres in the Christian world. Here in Glendalough, in County Wicklow, I always think the sense of Ireland's Christian past is particularly strong. There had been small settlements of monks scattered along the Irish coast for some time but it took St. Patrick to bring together the old religion of the Celts and the new Christianity. This new Irish Christianity turned out to be a powerful crusading force. With the collapse of the Roman Empire, Europe was once more plunged into the Dark Ages. And strangely enough, that's what gave us, I think, our first emigrants, the young Irish monks who left their Irish monasteries and brought the flame of Christianity back into that pagan continent. At home in Ireland, the monks built the unique round towers originally as bell towers and then later used them for keeping safe their priceless chalices and manuscripts. In their workrooms, the monks channeled their passionate Celtic sensitivity into glowing colour and intricate artwork. And certainly, the greatest and most beautiful of the manuscripts is the Book of Kells, now in the library of Trinity College, Dublin. The work of the monasteries, however, was to be disturbed by the arrival of the Vikings. For 200 years, they came as pirates to plunder gold from the great Irish monasteries. However, in 1014, they were finally defeated in battle by the High King of Ireland, Brian Boru, after which they became fully integrated into Irish society. The Vikings built Ireland's first towns and cities, including Dublin, Wexford, Cork and Limerick and their commercial ability is reflected today in Dublin's famous Moore Street Market. The Vikings left an indelible impression on the Irish. And with their demise as a great power, coupled with the death of Brian Boru, meant in fact that the High Kingship of Ireland was up for grabs. What followed was almost a century of political instability and unrest in which the greater Irish families fought amongst themselves for the title of High King of Ireland. It was an eventful century for the McMurrays. In the latter half of it, Dermot McMurray was put under constant pressure by the O'Rourke's and the O'Connors so much so that he was forced to flee the country. He fled to Wales, determined to use any means whatsoever to regain the kingship of Leinster. But a hundred years of shifting allegiances and bitter infighting left not only your ancestors, but the country as a whole, unprepared for the next wave of newcomers to disembark on Irish soil. The Normans, led by the great warrior Strongbow, arrived in 1169. Heavily protected by their coats of mail, they moved like modern tanks through the Irish countryside. They had arrived as mercenaries at the request of the deposed King of Leinster, but a combination of their military might and an attraction to the land of your ancestors induced them to make a more permanent foothold. Dermot MacMorrow, King of Leinster and a Murphy cousin, was the immediate cause of the Norman invasion of Ireland. 
Dermot had abducted the wife of the Oroka Brefni, as a result of which the Oroka attacked him ferociously. In desperation, he appealed to Henry II, King of England, for help. Henry granted Dermot a heavily armed force of Norman mercenaries. Two years to the day after the Norman arrival in Ireland, Dermot died mysteriously. The arrival of the Normans and the death of Dermot wrought great changes in the fortress of the Murphy clan. Murphys who didn't want to live under Norman rule scattered south and west to Cork and Limerick where they made alliances with the McCarthys and the O'Sullivans and in time became a force to be reckoned with in their own right in that part of the country. The Murphys who remained, however, quickly learned the Norman game and built their own stone castles, like this magnificent one here at Enniscorthy. Today, of course, it is the Wexford County Museum. Following his victories in battle, Strongbow took the hand of the King of Leinster's daughter, Eva, in marriage, and less than two years later, he had taken the crown for himself. Stony towers are not always protective, for here in Waterford, at Reginald's Tower, the marriage of Strongbow and Eva started a trend that would eventually undermine Norman influence in Ireland. You see, within a century, the Normans and the Irish intermarried, and the Normans adopted the Irish language and culture to a degree that made the English King John declare, the Normans are more Irish than the Irish themselves. By 1327, the Murphys had rebuilt their power base in Leinster to such an extent that the Norman government in Dublin became worried. The Normans under Duke Lionel made war on the Murphys and captured their chieftain Art Moore, who ended his days a prisoner in Dublin Castle. Art's son, Donal, took up the struggle. The Normans became so wearied by the fight that they agreed to pay 80 marks annually to the Murphys and this payment was made until 1536. The Murphys consolidated their strength by some very useful marriages. In one of the cleverest arranged marriages of them all, Saeed MacMurroghe Vornoch, daughter of Don Rea, was given to James Butler. Strangely enough, it was one of the descendants of Dermot's illegitimate sons who restored the fortunes of the Murphy clan in Leinster. You see, Art MacMurray had defeated the two greatest armies ever to land in Ireland. And on top of that, he was entirely responsible for the removal of Henry II from the throne of England. Now, the Normans took this lesson to heart and decided it was best to make peace with the Murphys. And this peace and the treaties thereto were strengthened by judicious intermarriage. Art MacMurray himself died a peaceful death and is entombed here in the lovely Abbey of St. Mullins on the River Barrow in the county of Wexford. Here at Bonretti Castle, the vibrant atmosphere of that period can be experienced in a banquet that is faithfully recreated using historical records from the time. My noble lords and ladies, my noble guests, the entry of your host this evening, the Earl of Thomond, Mr. Joe Lynch. Food and drink in the old style, music and song. This is how your ancestors entertained their friends. This castle now awakes. Its ancient glory stirred. The clink of mail and laughter fills its halls, and we inherit all its chivalry. Bonratty bids you welcome. A toast to all you here. Slaughter itself. Let the banquet begin. <laughs> Banquets were not always friendly or hospitable events, and families were not always at peace with themselves. The records abound with tales of family feuds ending in tragedy. In 1488, for example, one Mahon or Murphy, son of Tighe, Lord of the Wexford Murphys, was involved in a bloody feud with his cousin, Donna McMurray. Donna invited Mahon to dine with him. Mahon accepted the invitation as a gesture of goodwill. At the banquet, Mahon's wine was drugged, and as he lost consciousness, a dagger was thrust between his shoulder blades.
The Murphys and the McMurras were involved in a great many disputes down through the centuries, but more often than not they were united in their resistance to the English invaders. A resistance fierce and unyielding, so much so that in 1536, on June the 26th, the Lord Deputy of Ireland, a man called Grey, recommended in a letter to the King that more troops be sent to Ireland to wipe out the Murphys and the McMurras, along with the O'Burns and O'Tools, dispossess them of their lands and grant these lands to English settlers. Both the letter and the plan were unsuccessful. Not all the records tell of great fighting exploits, many concern ordinary court cases. For instance, we discovered in 1571 a record of a pardon granted to one Philip Fitz David Murphy of Dublin for an unspecified crime in return for a payment of a 10 shilling fine. During the 1500s, the power of the Celtic chieftains began to wane under sustained military pressure from the forces of the English crown. This, in turn, led to a series of rebellions. The last great Celtic revolt ended here at Kinsale in 1601. It had been led by the mighty Hugh O'Neill of Tyrone. In the year 1609, O'Neill and many of the other Irish chieftains left our shores. This was called the Flight of the Earls. It heralded the end of the old Celtic ways. Now it was a new Ireland, new kings, new centers of power. The flight of the earls is a testament to the concept of Ireland as an independent nation, the Celtic aristocracy choosing exile rather than submission. To consolidate their power in Ireland, the new rulers sent out clerks to record the names of Ireland. Unable to speak the Irish language, these clerks did not attempt to properly translate the indigenous names, but rather made approximate and phonetic translations. As you travel through Ireland today, you will notice how the signposts carry evidence of that name-changing process which began so long ago. For example, Bolia on Workig, meaning the town of the Murphys, became Bally Murphy. Cashlorn y Connell simply became Castle Connell. About this time, your name began to take on its present form. The old Gaelic or Marachu, from which Murphy is derived, was translated in a number of different ways, completely at the discretion of the particular clerk involved. It appears in the records as Omarahu, Omarahu, Moraho, and finally Murphy. But its meaning, descendant of the sea warrior, has never been forgotten. The essential Irish culture, however, remains strong and vibrant, and despite continued assault, it has remained so to this day. The Irish have always been proud of their heritage and culture, and nowhere is this more evident than in the art of heraldry. And here to tell you more about that is the former chief herald of Ireland, Gerard Slevin. Um, heraldry had its origin in the fact that the knight in medieval times, going into warfare, uh, was completely encased in armor, including his head. So there was no means of knowing who he was. So it became the practice to paint on his shield certain emblems or signs or symbols as a means of identification. Uh, heraldry has always had an extraordinary fascination for people, whatever it is about the shield shape and its contents. And in due course, uh, this personal practice spread to cities, universities, institutions, and is still very active. The primary purpose, as I have suggested, was identification. And I suppose that is still the essential purpose of heredity, is personal or institutional identification. The coat of arms is a window to your heritage. Each part is full of stories and mysteries. 
The shield displays what is known as the arms of the family and is a quartered shield in silver and red. The fess or center line across the shield represents military honor and acts as a background to the three garbs. The garbs are wheat sheaves which signify fertility and plenty. The lions rampant are an ancient heraldic symbol representing great strength and deathless courage. The crest, which is placed above the shield, mirrors the images of the shield, showing a red lion rampant holding a golden wheat sheaf in its paws. The motto truly captures the spirit of this great family. It is written in Latin and reads Fortis et Hospitalis, which means brave and hospitable. Many Irish people certainly are entitled to use arms, yes. The, the registers of the Office of Arms, the genealogical office as it is now, the Office of the Chief Herald, has registers going back many centuries. The 17th century saw England convulsed by two civil wars in which Ireland inevitably became involved. The Second War was actually fought entirely on Irish soil between 1688 and 1691 and led to disastrous consequences for the Irish. Sixteen ninety one saw the ending of the Williamite Wars with the signing of the Treaty of Limerick signed on this very stone. The wars are fought between two kings, William of Orange and James II, both of whom laid claim to the throne of England. In the event, victory went to King William. For the Irish who supported James II, exiles seemed to be the only honorable option. Known to history as the wild geese, these honorable soldiers of fortune sailed from Limerick to Europe, bringing with them the surnames of Ireland. For Ireland's freedom, we'll fight or die. This fine monument in the town of Enniscorthy commemorates the men of the uprising of 1798, and in particular the memory of the great Father Murphy, who led them. Like all the Murphys before and since, they were always ready to fight for the right. The French army that Father Murphy marched off to meet had many Irish commanders in their ranks. Their presence dated back to the wild geese, many of whom had become generals in the French army. Men like Matthew and Richard Murphy and Brian O. Murphy, who became a distinguished soldier and advisor to the French court. Brian's daughter, Marie-Louise O. Murphy, was an influential mistress of the French King Louis XV. Much of the Murphy clan lands were confiscated, leaving the remaining members of the clan to become tenants. While some Murphys, like Donna, managed to retain their land, it was at this point in history that your great and noble Murphy clan reached the end of its time as a united noble family. From the days of the early Christian missionaries to the present day, emigration has been an integral part of the history of the Irish people. From this small nation, Millions of Irish people have traveled the world over to Europe, Asia, the Americas, Africa, and Australasia. Although many left in search of adventure or to find their fortunes, many others didn't have the choice. In the aftermath of the wild geese, which had seen the best and brightest of their day depart, Ireland was to undergo many changes, the most dramatic of which was the massive transfer of land ownership. As the land changed, so too did the politics. In 1801, the Irish Parliament in Dublin was dissolved. And as the last vestiges of power dwindled, so too did the wealth of the country. And the land sank into poverty. In 1845, a blight arrived. The potato, the staple diet of the Irish people, was totally destroyed. So began the great Irish famine. And so too began the greatest migration of the Irish people. Plentiful supplies of foodstuffs were exported to Britain while the Irish people were faced with emigration in order to survive. A letter written in 1847 captures the sense of devastation. It is early morning as I write this last note before departing. We now join a huge army, forced to leave their native land. 
The heavy morning mist is a fitting curtain for the final scene, the climax of all our strivings against impossible odds. I cannot help but glance back through the pages of our history to the years when Ireland was a beacon of learning and faith whose light spread to all parts of Europe. God grant that those days of glory may someday return. Irish people emigrated in their hundreds of thousands. They set sail from Cove, Liverpool and Belfast. Cramped together on overcrowded ships, rife with hunger and disease, they arrived in Montreal, New York and Boston. In Australia, famine refugees followed those who had been transported there as convicts. Many of these convicts had been expelled from their home country on charges such as stealing bread. Others were belonging to revolutionary organizations. Despite their impoverished beginnings, the contribution made by those emigrants to their new countries was enormous. In the building of the modern world, from the late 17th century right up to the present day, the Irish have played a vital part in whatever society or culture they have settled in. Today, people of Irish descent number in excess of 70 million worldwide. In the annals of Irish history, the name of Murphy has held a distinguished place time and time again. There is John Murphy, better known as Shauna Mulachuna Rahinach, who lived between 1700 and 1770 and was the last chief of the Blarney Bards, and the most reverend John Murphy, Bishop of Cork, renowned for his scholarship and knowledge of all things Irish. The list of distinguished Murphys is constantly growing. It is many years since Murakhu, the great sea lord, was king of Leinster. But if you're a Murakhu, a Murphy, you'll want to come to Ireland and visit the places that the great Murphy clan have touched in Cork and Limerick to Prairie. But above all, you must come to County Carlow, here to Bally Murphy, named after the gallant Captain Matthew Murphy. Nestling under the shadow of Mount Leinster, there are still many Murphys living here today. Your ancestors, the Murphys, have lived in this land for centuries. They have played a hugely significant part in the story of Irish history. The old ways may be long gone, but the Murphys of today, spread as they are all over the world, can be proud of their Murphy heritage. <laughs> 